This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like, you know, to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. Welcome back once again to Another World Audiobooks. So excited to have you here. Have you checked out the YouTube channel? If you haven't, make sure to go over there and subscribe. Really trying to push that up to a thousand subscribers. We're getting getting closer every day, a little bit closer. So uh, if you could go over there and subscribe, I would just really, really appreciate that. Um, just, you know, kind of trying to do this podcast on a shoestring. And so being able to get monetized over there on YouTube would be a huge help to allow me to be continue to be able to bring you free, awesome audiobooks. Um, so I do so appreciate uh, people who have signed up to be patrons. Uh, but I know that's not for everybody. So uh, subscribing on YouTube is completely free. Pushes a, a sub toward that thousand uh, subscriber mark where we can start monetizing that channel, uh, which would be super helpful in uh, allowing me to continue to be able to do this for you. So uh, check it out. Anotherworldaudiobooks.com is where all the links are, and they're also in the description of the podcast. Uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Again, without further ado, I'll give you the next chapters of Sense and Sensibility. Chapter 18. Eleanor saw with great uneasiness the low spirits of her friend. His visit afforded her but a very partial satisfaction, while his own enjoyment in it appeared so imperfect. It was evident that he was unhappy. She wished it were equally evident that he still distinguished her by the same affection which once she had felt no doubt of inspiring. But hitherto the continuance of his preference seemed very uncertain, and the reservedness of his manner towards her contradicted one moment what a more animated look had intimated the preceding one. He joined her and Marianne in the breakfast room the next morning before the others were down, and Marianne, who was always eager to promote their happiness as far as she could, soon left them to themselves. But before she was halfway upstairs, she heard the parlour door open, and, turning round, was astonished to see Edward himself come out. "'I am going into the village to see my horses,' said he. As you are not yet ready for breakfast, I shall be back again presently. Edward returned to them with fresh admiration of the surrounding country. In his walk to the village, he had seen many parts of the valley to advantage, and the village itself, in a much higher situation than the cottage, afforded a general view of the whole which had exceedingly pleased him. This was a subject which ensured Marianne's attention, and she was beginning to describe her own admiration of these scenes, and to question him more minutely on the objects that had particularly struck him, when Edward interrupted her by saying, "'You must not inquire too far, Marianne. Remember, I have no knowledge in the picturesque, and I shall offend you by my ignorance and want of taste if we come to particulars.' I shall call hills steep, which ought to be bold, surfaces strange and uncouth, which ought to be irregular and rugged, and distant objects out of sight, which ought only to be indistinct through the soft medium of a hazy atmosphere. You must be satisfied with such admirations as I can honestly give. I call it a very fine country, the hills are steep, the woods seem full of fine timber, and the valleys look comfortable and snug, with rich meadows and several neat farmhouses scattered here and there. It exactly answers my idea of a fine country, because it unites beauty and utility, and I dare say it is a picturesque one, too, because you admire it. I can easily believe it to be full of rocks and promontories, grey moss and brushwood, but these are all lost on me. I know nothing of the picturesque. I am afraid it is but too true, said Marianne. But why should you boast of it? I suspect, said Eleanor that to avoid one kind of affectation, Edward here falls into another, because he believes many people pretend to more admiration of the beauties of nature than they really feel, and is disgusted with such pretensions. He affects greater indifference and less discrimination in viewing them himself than he possesses. He is fastidious, and will have an affectation of his own. "'It is very true,' said Marianne. That admiration of landscape scenery has become a mere jargon. Everybody pretends to feel and tries to describe with taste and elegance of him who first defined what picturesque beauty was. I detest jargon of every kind. 
and sometimes I have kept my feelings to myself because I could find no language to describe them in but what was worn and hackneyed out of all sense and meaning. I am convinced, said Edward, that you really feel all the delight in a fine prospect which you profess to feel. But in return, your sister must allow me to feel no more than I profess. I like a fine prospect, but not on picturesque principles. I do not like crooked, twisted, blasted trees. I admire them much more if they are tall, straight, and flourishing. I do not like ruined, tattered cottages. I am not fond of nettles or thistles or heath blossoms. I have more pleasure in a snug farmhouse than a watchtower, and a troop of tidy, happy villagers please me better than the finest banditti in the world. Marianne looked with amazement at Edward, with compassion at her sister. Only Eleanor laughed. The subject was continued no farther, and Marianne remained thoughtfully silent till a new object suddenly engaged her attention. She was sitting by Edward, and in taking his tea from Mrs. Dashwood, his hand passed so directly before her as to make a ring with a plait of hair in the centre very conspicuous on one of his fingers. "'I never saw you wear a ring before, Edward,' she cried. "'Is that Fanny's hair? I remember her promising to give you some, but I should have thought her hair had been darker.' Marianne spoke inconsiderately what she really felt, but when she saw how much she had pained Edward, her own vexation of her want of thought could not be surpassed by his. He coloured very deeply, and giving a momentary glance at Eleanor, replied, "'Yes, it is my sister's hair. The setting always casts a different shade on it, you know.' Eleanor had met his eye, and looked conscious likewise. That the hair was her own, she instantaneously felt as well satisfied as Marianne. The only difference in their conclusions was that what Marianne considered as a free gift from her sister, Eleanor was conscious must have been procured by some theft or contrivance unknown to herself. She was not in a humour, however, to regard it as an affront, and affecting to take no notice of what passed by instantly talking of something else, she internally resolved henceforth to catch every opportunity of eyeing the hair and of satisfying herself, beyond all doubt, that it was exactly the shade of her own. Edward's embarrassment lasted some time, and it ended in an absence of mind still more settled. He was particularly grave the whole morning. Marianne severely censured herself for what she had said, but her own forgiveness might have been more speedy had she known how little offence it had given her sister. Before the middle of the day, they were visited by Sir John and Mrs. Jennings, who, having heard of the arrival of a gentleman at the cottage, came to take a survey of the guest. With the assistance of his mother-in-law, Sir John was not long in discovering that the name of Ferris begins with an F. And this prepared a future mine of raillery against the devoted Eleanor, which nothing but the newness of their acquaintance with Edward could have prevented from being immediately sprung. But, as it was, she only learned from some very significant looks how far their penetration, founded on Margaret's instructions, extended. Sir John never came to the Dashwoods without either inviting them to dine at the park the next day, or to drink tea with them that evening. On the present occasion, for the better entertainment of their visitor, towards whose amusement he felt himself bound to contribute, he wished to engage them for both. "'You must drink tea with us tonight,' said he, "'for we shall be quite alone, and tomorrow you must absolutely dine with us, for we shall be a large party.' Mrs. Jennings enforced the necessity. "'And who knows, but you may raise a dance,' said she. "'And that will tempt you, Miss Marianne.' "'A dance?' cried Marianne. "'Impossible! Who is to dance?' "'Who? Why, yourselves, and the Carries, and Whittakers, to be sure. "'What, you thought nobody could dance because a certain person that shall be nameless is gone?' "'I wish with all my soul,' cried Sir John, "'that Willoughby were among us again.' This, and Marianne's blushing, gave new suspicions to Edward. "'And who is Willoughby?' said he in a low voice to Miss Dashwood, by whom he was sitting. She gave him a brief reply. Marianne's countenance was more communicative. Edward saw enough to comprehend not only the meaning of others, but such of Marianne's expressions as had puzzled him before. And when their visitors left them, he went immediately round her and said in a whisper, "'I have been guessing.' "'Shall I tell you my guess?' "'What do you mean?' "'Shall I tell you?' "'Certainly. 
Well, then, I guess that Mr. Willoughby hunts. Marianne was surprised and confused, yet she could not help smiling at the quiet archness of his manner, and after a moment of silence said, Oh, Edward, how can you? But the time will come, I hope. I am sure you will like him. I do not doubt it, replied he, rather astonished at his earnestness and warmth. For, had he not imagined it to be a joke for the good of her acquaintance in general, found only on a something or a nothing between Mr. Willoughby and herself, he would not have ventured to mention it. Chapter 19 Edward remained a week at the cottage. He was earnestly pressed by Mrs. Dashwood to stay longer, but as if he were bent only on self-mortification, he seemed resolved to be gone when his enjoyment among his friends was at the height. His spirits, during the last two or three days, though still very unequal, were greatly improved. He grew more and more partial to the house and environs, never spoke of going away without a sigh, declared his time to be wholly disengaged, even doubted to what place he should go when he left them. But still, go he must. Never had any week pass so quickly, he could hardly believe it to be gone. He said so repeatedly. Other things he said, too, which marked the turn of his feelings, and gave the lie to his actions. He had no pleasure at Norland. He detested being in town, but either to Norland or London he must go. He valued their kindness beyond anything, and his greatest happiness was in being with them. Yet he must leave them at the end of a week, in spite of their wishes and his own, and without any restraint on his time. Eleanor placed all that was astonishing in this way of acting to his mother's account, and it was happy for her that he had a mother whose character was so imperfectly known to her as to be the general excuse for everything strange on the part of her son. Disappointed, however, and vexed as she was, and sometimes displeased with his unsudden behaviour to herself, she was very well disposed on the whole to regard his actions with all the candid allowances and generous qualifications which had been rather more painfully extorted from her for Willoughby's service by her mother. His want of spirits, of openness, and of consistency were most usually attributed to his want of independence and his better knowledge of Mrs. Ferris's disposition and designs. The shortness of his visit, the steadiness of his purpose in leaving them, originated in the same fettered inclination, the same inevitable necessity of temporizing with his mother. The old, well-established grievance of duty against will, parent against child, was the cause of all. She would have been glad to know when these difficulties were to cease, this opposition was to yield, when Mrs. Ferris would be reformed and her son be at liberty to be happy. But from such vain wishes she was forced to turn for comfort to the renewal of her confidence in Edward's affection, to the remembrance of every mark of regard in look or word which fell from him while at Barton, and above all to that flattering proof of it which he constantly wore round his finger. I think, Edward, said Mrs. Dashwood, as they were at breakfast the last morning, you would be a happier man if you had any profession to engage your time and give an interest to your plans and actions. Some inconvenience to your friends, indeed, might result from it. You would not be able to give them so much of your time, but, with a smile, you would be materially benefited in one particular at least. You would know where to go when you left them. I do assure you, he replied, that I have long thought on this point, as you think now. It has been, and is, and probably will always be a heavy misfortune to me, that I have had no necessary business to engage me, no profession to give me employment or afford me anything like independence. But unfortunately, my own nicety, and the nicety of my friends, have made me what I am, an idle, helpless being. We never could agree in our choice of a profession." I always preferred the church, as I still do, but that was not smart enough for my family. They recommended the army. That was a great deal too smart for me. The law was allowed to be genteel enough. Many young men, who had chambers in the temple, made a very good appearance in the first circles, and drove about town in very knowing gigs. But I had no inclination for the law, even in this less abstruse study of it which my family approved. As for the navy, it had fashion on its side, but I was too old when the subject was first started to enter it, and at length, as there was no necessity for my having any profession at all, as I might be as dashing and expensive without a red coat on my back as with one, 
idleness was pronounced on the whole to be most advantageous and honourable, and a young man of eighteen is not in general so earnestly bent on being busy as to resist the solicitations of his friends to do nothing. I was therefore entered at Oxford, and have been properly idle ever since. The consequence of which I suppose will be, said Mrs. Dashwood, since leisure has not promoted your own happiness, that your sons will be brought up to as many pursuits, employments, professions, and trades as Columella's. They will be brought up, said he in a serious accent, to be as unlike myself as is possible, in feeling, in action, in condition, in everything. Come, come, this is all an effusion of immediate want of spirits, Edward. You are in a melancholy humour, and fancy that any one unlike yourself must be happy. But remember that the pain of parting from friends will be felt by everybody at times, whatever be their education or state. Know your own happiness. You want nothing but patience, or give it a more fascinating name. Call it hope. Your mother will secure to you in time that independence you are so anxious for. It is her duty, and it will, it must, ere long, become her happiness to prevent your whole youth from being wasted in discontent. How much may not a few months do? I think, replied Edward, that I may defy many months to produce any good to me. This desponding turn of mind, though it could not be communicated to Mrs. Dashwood, gave additional pain to them all in the parting, which shortly took place, and left an uncomfortable impression on Eleanor's feelings especially, which required some trouble and time to subdue. But as it was her determination to subdue it, and to prevent herself from appearing to suffer more than what all her family suffered on his going away, she did not adopt the same method so judiciously employed by Marianne, on a similar occasion, to augment and fix her sorrow by seeking silence, solitude, and idleness. Their means were as different as their objects, and equally suited to the advancement of each. Eleanor sat down to her drawing-table as soon as he was out of the house, busily employed herself the whole day, neither sought nor avoided the mention of his name, appeared to interest herself almost as much as ever in the general concerns of the family, and if, by this conduct, she did not lessen her own grief, it was at least prevented from unnecessary increase, and her mother and sisters were spared much solicitude on her account. Such behaviour as this, so exactly reverse of her own, appeared no more meritous to Marianne than her own had seemed faulty to her. The business of self-command she settled very easily. With strong affections it was impossible, with calm ones it could have no merit. That her sister's affections were calm she dared not deny, though she blushed to acknowledge it, and of the strength of her own she gave a very striking proof by still loving and respecting that sister in spite of this mortifying conviction. Without shutting herself up from her family, or leaving the house in determined solitude to avoid them, or lying awake the whole night to indulge meditation, Eleanor found every day afforded her leisure enough to think of Edward, and of Edward's behaviour, in every possible variety which the different state of her spirits at different times could produce, with tenderness, pity, approbation, censure, and doubt. There were moments in abundance when, if not by the absence of her mother and sisters, at least by the nature of their employments, conversation was forbidden among them, and every effect of solitude was produced. Her mind was inevitably at liberty. Her thoughts could not be chained elsewhere, and the past and the future on a subject so interesting must be before her, must force her attention, and engross her memory, her reflection, and her fancy. From a reverie of this kind, as she sat at her drawing-table, she was roused one morning, soon after Edward's leaving them, by the arrival of company. She happened to be quite alone. The closing of the little gate, at the entrance of the green court in front of the house, drew her eyes to the window, and she saw a large party walking up to the door. Amongst them were Sir John and Lady Middleton and Mrs. Jennings, but there were two others, a gentleman and lady, who were quite unknown to her. She was sitting near the window, and as soon as Sir John perceived her, he left the rest of the party to the ceremony of knocking at the door, and stepping across the turf, obliged her to open the casement to speak to him, though the space was so short between the door and the window as to make it hardly possible to speak at one without being heard at the other. "'Well,' said he, "'we have brought you some strangers. How do you like them?' "'Hush, they will hear you.' 
Never mind if they do. It is only the Palmers. Charlotte is very pretty, I can tell you. You may see her if you look this way. As Eleanor was certain of seeing her in a couple of minutes, without taking that liberty, she begged to be excused. Where is Marianne? Has she run away because we are come? I see her instrument is open. She is walking, I believe. They were now joined by Mrs. Jennings, who had not patience enough to wait till the door was open before she told her story. She came hallooing to the window. How do you do, my dear? How does Mrs. Dashwood do? And where are your sisters? What? All alone? You will be glad of a little company to sit with you. I have brought my other son and daughter to see you. Only think of their coming so suddenly. I thought I heard a carriage last night while we were drinking our tea, but it never entered my head that it could be them. I thought of nothing but whether it might not be Colonel Brandon come back again, so I said to Sir John, I do think I hear a carriage. Perhaps it is Colonel Brandon come back again. Eleanor was obliged to turn from her in the middle of her story to receive the rest of the party. Lady Middleton introduced the two strangers. Mrs. Dashwood and Margaret came downstairs at the same time, and they all sat down to look at one another, while Mrs. Jennings continued her story as she walked through the passage into the parlour, attended by Sir John. Mrs. Palmer was several years younger than Lady Middleton, and totally unlike her in every respect. She was short and plump, had a very pretty face, and the finest expression of good humour in it that could possibly be. Her manners were by no means so elegant as her sister's, but they were much more prepossessing. She came in with a smile, smiled all the time of her visit, except when she laughed, and smiled when she went away. Her husband was a grave-looking young man, of five or six and twenty, with an air of more fashion and sense than his wife, but of less willingness to please or be pleased. He entered the room with a look of self-consequence, slightly bowed to the ladies without speaking a word, and, after briefly surveying them and their apartment, took up a newspaper from the table and continued to read it as long as he stayed. Mrs. Palmer, on the contrary, who was strongly endowed by nature with a turn for being uniformly civil and happy, was hardly seated before her admiration of the parlour and everything in it burst forth. "'Well, what a delightful room this is! I never saw anything so charming! Only think, Mamma, how it has improved since I was here last. I always thought it such a sweet place, ma'am.' Turning to Mrs. Dashwood, "'But you have made it so charming! Only look, sister, how delightful everything is! How I should like such a house for myself! Should not you, Mr. Palmer?' Mr. Palmer made no answer, and did not even raise his eyes from the newspaper. "'Mr. Palmer does not hear me,' said she, laughing. "'He never does sometimes. It is so ridiculous.' This was quite a new idea to Mrs. Dashwood. She had never been used to find wit in the inattention of anyone, and could not help looking with surprise at them both. Mrs. Jennings, in the meantime, talked on as loud as she could, and continued her account of their surprise the evening before on seeing their friends, without ceasing till everything was told. Mrs. Palmer laughed heartily at the recollection of their astonishment, and everybody agreed, two or three times over, that it had been quite an agreeable surprise. "'You may believe how glad we all were to see them,' added Mrs. Jennings, leaning forward towards Eleanor, and speaking in a low voice, as if she meant to be heard by no one else, though they were seated on different sides of the room." But, however, I can't help wishing they had not travelled quite so fast, nor made such a long journey of it, for they came all round by London upon account of some business, for you know, nodding significantly and pointing to her daughter, it was wrong in her situation. I wanted her to stay home and rest this morning, but she would come with us. She longed so much to see you all. Mrs. Palmer laughed and said it would not do her any harm. She expects to be confined in February, continued Mrs. Jennings. Lady Middleton could no longer endure such a conversation, and therefore exerted herself to ask Mr. Palmer if there was any news in the paper. No, none at all, he replied, and read on. Here comes Marianne, cried Sir John. Now, Palmer, you shall see a monstrous pretty girl. He immediately went into the passage, opened the front door, and ushered her in himself. Mrs. Jennings asked her, as soon as she appeared, if she had not been to Allenham. And Mrs. Palmer laughed so heartily at the question as to show she understood it. 
Mr. Palmer looked up on her entering the room, stared at her some minutes, and then returned to his newspaper. Mrs. Palmer's eye was now caught by the drawings which hung round the room. She got up to examine them. Oh, dear, how beautiful these are! Well, how delightful! But do look, Mamma, how sweet! I declare they are quite charming. I could look at them for ever. And then, sitting down again, she very soon forgot that there were any such things in the room. When Lady Middleton rose to go away, Mr. Palmer rose also, laid down the newspaper, stretched himself, and looked at them all round. "'My love, have you been asleep?' said his wife, laughing. He made her no answer, and only observed, after again examining the room, that it was very low-pitched, and that the ceiling was crooked. He then made his bow, and departed with the rest. Sir John had been very urgent with them all to spend the next day at the park. Mrs. Dashwood, who did not choose to dine with them oftener than they dined at the cottage, absolutely refused on her own account. Her daughters might do as they pleased, but they had no curiosity to see how Mr. and Mrs. Palmer ate their dinner, and no expectation of pleasure from them in any other way. They attempted, therefore, likewise to excuse themselves. The weather was uncertain and not likely to be good, but Sir John would not be satisfied. The carriage should be sent for them, and they must come. Lady Middleton, too, though she did not press their mother, pressed them. Mrs. Jennings and Mrs. Palmer joined their entreaties. All seemed equally anxious to avoid a family party, and the young ladies were obliged to yield. "'Why should they ask us?' said Marianne, as soon as they were gone. "'The rent of this cottage is said to be low, but we have it on very hard terms if we are to dine at the park whenever anyone is staying either with them or with us.' "'They mean no less to be civil and kind to us now,' said Eleanor, "'by these frequent invitations than by those which we received from them a few weeks ago. The alteration is not in them, if their parties are grown tedious and dull. We must look for the change elsewhere.' <laughs> all, right, all right, there you go. I hope you guys are enjoying this book so far. I love the juxtaposition of Eleanor and Marianne. Couldn't, uh, couldn't be more different if they tried. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so much uh, for people who have been leaving comments on YouTube and on Spotify. If you want to get in touch with me, that's probably one of the easiest ways to do it. I would definitely see uh, those when they happen. Or if you want to leave a review of the podcast, if you're enjoying this, reviews help so much. They take just a few seconds, and then uh, everybody can see whether or not this is a podcast worth listening to, which if you're listening this far into the middle of this book, I'm assuming you think the podcast is somewhat worthwhile. So drop a review. I would so, so, so appreciate it, and uh, helps spread the word and, and keep uh, more listeners coming in this way so I can continue to do free audiobooks for you. Thanks guys for listening and we'll catch you next week.